Windows Forms, also known as WinForms, is one of the original project types in .NET. It is designed to be a rapid application development environment for desktop applications. Over the past 20 years, other desktop application types such as WPF, UWP, and now .NET MAUI have come along. So when will we use WinForms? In this video, I'm going to show you what WinForms is, how to build it, what the best practices are, how to avoid some common pitfalls, and when you should use the WinForms project type. This project type still has value, even though we have other shinier tools in our toolbox. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Corey, and it's my goal to make learning C Sharp easier. I do that by providing videos here on YouTube multiple times per week. Plus, I have a weekly podcast. I also provide courses on C Sharp, web development, and much more at IamTimCorey.com. The profits from those sales are what pays for the free content here on YouTube so that everyone can have a great education in C Sharp, not just those who can afford it. In this video, as with most of my videos, I'm going to create some source code. If you'd like a copy of the source code, use the link in the description. All right, here's Visual Studio. We're going to create a new project, and today we're going to use the, the .NET 6 version of WinForms because there is a little bit of a difference here. So if we choose the, um, I'm sorry, the desktop project type over here for filter, We'll see Windows Form App. Now, I also have Windows Form App for .NET Framework. But we're going to choose this one right here, Windows Form App, which is the .NET Core version. And it's going to ask me which version in just a minute. We're going to call this the WinForms Demo and WinForm Demo App. And we're going to say .NET 6. So there is, just so you know, a bit of a dividing line between .NET Framework and .NET Core. It wasn't just the fact that, yes, we upgraded the backend C-sharp code language and what it builds upon to be .NET Core. There was also a replacement of the Windows Form Designer. So there is a different designer for this than there is for the .NET Framework version. Now, you probably won't be able to tell visually, but it is different. Let's hit create. So the difference here is they had to kind of rewrite things in order to work with .NET Core. So when you work with it, you might find a glitch or two, um, even though they pretty much worked out most of the bugs, but that's because it is a totally new designer as compared to the original designer that had been around for well over a decade, almost two decades. So this is what you get with windows forms out of the box when you first start up you already have a design surface you can work with that has the minimize the maximize and the close buttons you have a little name up top form one a little icon and you can actually just run this and let's just do that right now to see that with just a bare template we already have what could be considered a working app you can resize it you can maximize it, you can restore it, you can minimize it, you can close with the X button. Now, of course, that doesn't have any of your code, it doesn't actually do anything, but that is the, the foundation of a Windows Form app. But I'm gonna kind of walk through why we use this project type. Well, I mentioned earlier that this is a rapid application development environment. It's designed to be able to get you out the door quickly with a project. Now, this can be taken too far. This can be taken into extremes that really cause um, you to get your application out the door fast, but then have long-term problems. We don't want that. So let's talk through what is rapid application development. Well, let's say you have an idea for an application. You wanna do a, a test of it to verify that, hey, you know, let's just see if this even works. Well, it's very easy to create a proof of concept using Windows Forms. You see this toolbox over here has a whole bunch of controls. And let's just pretend we're gonna start off and really make a mess of things and that's okay. We're gonna see how to fix those. But you start dragging on, you see, oh, I'm on a button. And I'm gonna make this a little bigger. We're gonna come here as a button and we're gonna have a, 
let's go with a text box. We're going to grab a couple of those. So we'll put one there and we'll create a label for that too. And so we'll put that there and kind of line it up. And then we'll just do a, well, I hit control the way select one, hit control and hit the other one. And I can control C and control V to copy and paste. Notice the, the nice lines that line this up. And before you know it, I have what looks like a pretty decent form set up and I can actually do things with this. And that was pretty quick. I have what is or could be a working application. So I now have forms. I can, you know, type it. I hit tab, go to the next field and so on. I hit tab again, hit the button is right there. Now it doesn't do anything, but it could. You might say, well, let's, you know, up the complexity a little bit and put a little checkbox in here, line that up and so on. So you can, you can really um, do a lot of stuff just by dragging and dropping. There's a progress bar, which right now is, is empty. But if we went to properties over here, um, I believe the, it's the value, let's just put the value of 45. And there you go. There's a progress bar at 45 out of 100. So there is your really rapid proof of concept. And this could be used for design only if you wanted to. You could just say, hey, let's just look and see if this works as far as a visual design. But then you could even start wiring things up a little bit and say, well, if you double click on a button, it creates an event. So I double click the button and it creates an event and it puts us, let's unpin all of this. It puts us into the code and it says private void button one click. So when the button one is clicked, this is what's going to happen. This code right here. And I could say, well, you know what? Let's do a um, message box dot show. And we're going to put a message in here. So we'll put a string interpolation. And I'll put a semicolon at the end. I want to grab the values from this first uh, text box and the second text box. So I could say, hello. And then the first text box is probably called text box one. Yep. And say dot text. And then space text box two dot text. So what we're doing is pretending here the first text box maybe has a first name and the second text box has a last name. And so a text box is an object. We're going to talk about these objects in a minute, but it's an object in the form. And if we go to properties here, we'll see that it's called text box one or up here's a name text box one. So you can tell that's text box one and this one is text box two, I'm assuming. Yep. So by doing this, we can grab the values out of it. So this right here, we can grab a text, which is the, the actual text inside this box. And so with just those little tweaks of code, I can put, you know, Tim, Corey, and I can come down here to hit, hit the button and it says, hello, Tim, Corey. So we've got what could be considered a working application. And if you've ever taken a C-sharp course in college or somewhere else, that's probably the first demo you ever saw is something like this, where you just drag and drop some stuff on me, some rename some stuff like label one to be first name, but you built this application. You think, cool, I'm a developer, which you are, you have written applications, you have written code. So don't let anybody tell you you're not a developer, but you're not a very good developer yet. You've got some, you got some ways to go. And really, I don't like teaching windows forms as the first place to learn C sharp. So if you are brand new to C sharp, this is not the place to start. This is, you know, it's intro to, this is not the place to start to learn C sharp because there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we're going to talk about. And if you are not familiar with object oriented programming, this is going to be a bit complex and it's going to be a whole lot of magic because right now you've seen magic and I'm not a big fan of you just saying, well, it's magic because when magic breaks, things happen. In fact, before we go on, I'm going to show you one of the most common problems that people have in Windows Forms. I used to teach at a college and I taught C Sharp and there was other professors that also taught the intro C Sharp course. And so I would get students from other classes that would come to me um, trying to take the course again. And one of the things I would ask them is, what did you do when the designer broke? And the answer was, I would start over. So I'm going to show you what happens when the designer breaks. So let's, 
let's say we're working on here. We accidentally double click the form itself and go, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's go ahead and get rid of that code because that's, that's not, I didn't want to do that. Cool. Okay. We're going to save that, come back over here. And what will happen is and actually it's not breaking right now, which is awesome. Maybe I change this, but let's open it back up. Hey, there we go. Um, the form broke. So when I try to open the form up, I can't. Like normally you double click this form one, it opens up and it says, the designer cannot process unknown name form one underscore load at line 153. So you're like, well, no, 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 let's try this again. Nope, still didn't work. So you restart Visual Studio because maybe it's a stupid Visual Studio bug. It's not a Visual Studio bug. So they, the, the answer a lot of new developers come up with is I have to delete my projects and start over because they don't know how to fix this. The magic broke because the magic was just the form designer just works, right? Well, no, there's actually code that, that powers it, that we can modify, that we have access to. So what's the problem here? Well, when I was in the code, I deleted some code here. Let's see if I can control Z. I can't control Z because that's already closed. Uh, I deleted some, some code here that said form one click, I believe. Um, that was an event handler like this is. So I, I didn't need it though, so I deleted it. But for some reason, now my form designer doesn't work. Well, those two things are, oh, it wasn't click, it was load. Those two things are related, but maybe you didn't realize that. Maybe you did, you did multiple things like you saw with me, it even seemed to still work on the designer, but then you close out and restart and it doesn't work. Well, the issue is I deleted the handler in one spot, but not the other. And this is where understanding how Windows Forms works really helps. Also, reading error messages really helps. The error messages in Visual Studio used to be, now I'm an old school developer. I have worked with, with Microsoft error messages for 25, almost 30 years. So I've seen a lot of bad error messages and they used to be horrible. It used to say an error has occurred. And that was about all the information you had. But now we have really good error messages a lot of the time. And often people just skip over it and say, I don't know what's happening. Well, guess what? You can read this and it will tell you what's happening and tell you where to go. So it says the designer cannot process unknown name form one underscore load at line 153. The code within the method initialized component is generated by the designer and should not be manually modified. Please remove any changes and try opening the designer again. And it says, go to code. There's a button right here. Click it. And it takes you right here, a line, it says 153, it's actually 154. Um, this line right here, notice the red squigglies. But how do we get here? Well, a Windows form is actually a, has a split class behind it. So if we right click on Windows for, winform.cs and say view code, we get this code, which we've seen. But notice it says public partial class. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to put two different files or two different places to put form one class code. And the benefit here is mostly just for these type of environments. Usually don't use this in our own personal development, but with a generated form, Microsoft generates code for WinForms. And so it says, hey, we don't want you messing around with this generated code. So we're gonna put that generated code in one partial class. And then we're gonna give you the rest of the code, the code you can modify freely in the other partial class. And then when the compiler goes to compile our application, it takes those two partial classes and puts them together as one file. So it's just a, uh, a convenience for us. So we don't see all the generated code in here. But where is that generated code? Well, it's in form1.designer.cs. So you double click on this. This is, if you expand out form1.cs, you'll see it right here. So it's designer.cs. This is code that you should almost never modify. I say almost never because we're gonna modify it. Let's open it up. 
And this right here is generated code. Okay, this is code generated by, by the designer. Required method for designer support. Do not modify the contents of this method with the code editor. It's saying don't make changes here. Now, that's a pretty strong warning. And yeah, you probably, in, in 99 cases out of 100, you should not modify this. However, there are times when it is the right call to make a modification here. So let's go down and look. Notice this dot button one equals new button, new text box, new label, new label, new text box. That looks familiar, new progress bar, new checkbox. That is a code representation of the items on our form. We'll get back to that in just a minute. We have here configure button one, it says, which is great. It's great how they um, put all this stuff together and really document it, even though you're not supposed to modify it. But it says location, name, size, tab index, text, visual style, back color, and the click event. This is all the stuff related to that button. But then we come down here to the line 154, I believe, and we see that this is the form one section. And we see controls.add, progress bar, checkbox, and all the rest. But then down here, we see load plus equals. This is an event. So the load is an event handler, and we're associating, we're associating, I'm sorry, the load is an event, and we're associating event handlers with it. So we're associating a new event handler for the form load. And this was in the other half of this class. Notice. I didn't even show you. Up here, this is partial class form one. Over here, we had public partial class form one. Those two connect. Those are the two things going to get added together. But down here on line 154, we say new event handler and say this, which just means this class um, or this object, and say form one dot underscore load, which we put that code over here in this half of the partial class, just like button one underscore click, but it's not here. Because it's not here, it's having, it has an error because it doesn't exist. The solution is to get rid of this line. That will take away that handler. Now, I am modifying the automatically generated code. That's okay in this particular case. If I hit save, go back to the designer, we can now see the form. So what happened that caused the problem? Then what do we do to fix it? Well, when we double click anywhere, it creates the default event. And why do I say default event? Well, if we click on the button, which we already know has an event, and if we double click on it, it goes to this event, button one, underscore click, or the event handler, the actual method to handle the event. But there's more events we could do. We have properties. Let's pin this for a minute. Well, let's not. Let's go to events. So up here, let's zoom in. This is the properties window, but the properties window not only has the properties of our button, but it also has this little lightning bolt here, which is events. And these are all the potential events for our button. Let's kind of zoom back out and look at all of these. It, even on my screen, it only goes through E and all the events we could do, and we can scroll down through. So for instance, we could have an event on mouse hover or mouse click, because we have on click right now, which would be any type of click. So it'd be if you tap it with your finger, if you click it with a mouse click, if you um, tab over it and hit the space bar, those are all click events. But we could have on just mouse click, we could say, hey, you know what? When it's uh, the visibility has changed, do something, which doesn't happen very often. Um, we could have it be when you drag and drop something onto it. There's a lot of different things you could do on the event, but the standard one is for a button is click. So by default, when you want to create an event, you probably create it on click not on, there's a, I think there's a double click in here. Um, but 
you can have on different things, you know, right click and all the rest, but uh, it's probably under um, mouse click or, um, hmm, I thought there was a double click. Anyways, not a big deal. Um, but what you can do is modify, you can monitor different events, but for this case, there's only one that we usually use. And so Microsoft says, hey, that's the default one. So if you double click on this, I'm going to create that event. When you create, click on the form itself, well, we don't normally track when a person clicks on the form. That would probably be annoying. But there are other events on the form. So this is the form one, and one of them is load right down here occurs whenever the user loads the form. So sometimes you want to do something when the form loads. Maybe it's uh, put up a splash screen, or maybe it's uh, put the cursor in the right spot, or maybe it is to uh, start a timer that does something after a certain number of, of seconds. There's a lot of things you could do on the load. That's probably the most common event that we do, we monitor for the form. So when we double clicked on the form, the designer says, hey, a double click means create the default event for this item. And so it created the load event. But then when we went over here, we said, oh, I don't actually want that event handler, which that little bit of code like this. And we, so we deleted it, but we didn't delete the actual event handler wiring it up. We just deleted the code for the event handler. Well, then the Windows form couldn't generate the actual display for the form. And so it says, I don't know what to do, I'm gonna break. Which brings us to an important point. What we see here, the actual visual design of our form is just code being rendered in the designer. That's all it is. So when we look over here and we see all this code this code is responsible for what this layout looks like. So when we mess something up where it kind of breaks that code, it can't render this form because this form doesn't, doesn't just exist. It has to be created. It's essentially running our Windows form UI in the designer. Now, it's not the exact same because it's just displaying. It's not actually responding to events and other things, but that's kind of what I was doing. And so when we mess up the code, it messes up the ability to render this, which means it can't even show us the designer because the designer isn't just magic. It actually has to be built off of logic. And if that logic is broken, the designer is broken. So let's talk about what Windows Forms is. Windows Forms is really a class. That's all it is. So there's a special class called the form class, which we inherit from. Notice the inheritance right here. So we're inheriting from form, which brings a whole lot of uh, methods and events and other things with it. And then we just add other classes to it. So this is our, the uh, designer. So here's our partial class form one. And notice on the initialized component, We've got this dot button one equals, and look at this, equals new system dot windows dot forms dot button. That's a class. Text box is a class. Label is a class. Checkbox is a class. Progress bar is a class. We're just adding class objects to variables inside of our class or our form one class. So what we're doing here is just creating a pretty complex class with a whole bunch of properties and methods inside of it. And it just happens that we can then use that to render a visual like this. So all of this happens because we inherit from form, which has figured out how to render this stuff on the page. Form is what gives us the outline, the gray background, the minimize, maximize, and close buttons, the ability to resize the window, the ability to render the button and all the rest of things the way we expect them to. So that's all based upon inheritance 
And it's all based upon bringing all that, those libraries from Microsoft into our form. We're building on the shoulders of giants. They, Microsoft has done a lot of work just to give us this shell. When I was uh, playing around with C++ early, early on, this is decades ago, but I was playing with C++ and, and trying to build a, a Windows form, basically, a, a form for a screen, but from scratch, just code. And I wrote dozens and dozens of lines of code to build out from scratch this, this form that would be on my display. And I was just getting started. And so I got to a point where I said, I think this is what would actually render my, my page, render my, my view, my form. And so I ran the application and it didn't seem to work until I tried to click anywhere on the screen. And then I realized that I had created a transparent window that was across the entire window that had no minimize button. It had no close button. It had no ability to, to give me a right click menu. It was just a big transparent window. And so the way I solved that was to restart my application, restart my, I'm sorry, my whole computer in order to restart my application because I couldn't get out of it because I needed to code the minimize button. I needed to code the ability to have a background. I need to code the right click menu. I need to code all that stuff. And I hadn't yet. Well, with Windows Forms, Microsoft says, you know what? You're going to be creating these minimize, maximize, and close buttons all the time. Why don't we do it for you? And we're, you, need to, you need to have this title bar and the title and the icon and the resize ability every time. So why don't we create it for you? And this is how we don't repeat ourselves. This is dry because Microsoft said, we'll do all that work inside of form. And this is where inheritance is really valuable in C Sharp because we can inherit all of that pre-done work for us in a way that makes sense. It's not just code sharing. It's actually makes sense that we create a base form that we then inherit from. And if you actually hit, you can, on this rabbit trail, it's quite a rabbit trail, but hit F12 on form, and it's gonna take you to the namespace system.windows.forms, and it's the class form that we're inheriting from. And notice all the stuff that it adds to the class. But then notice that at the top, it actually inherits from container control. Well, if you have 12 here, container control adds a whole bunch of stuff. Notice about 370 lines of code. That's just the actual definitions and not actually code itself. That's more than that. But then it inherits from scrollable control and it implements the I container control. Let's go to scrollable control, hit F12. And that adds a whole bunch of stuff but then that inherits from control. Also notice all the interfaces here, but control hit F12 and that brings in a whole bunch of stuff and you can go down this rabbit hole all the way through component and so on. But that's all the stuff that we're bringing in. That's what kind of, they have invented the wheel. They have invented the engine. They have invented the doors and the, all the other things for a car and said, okay, here's all the parts and you can just, kind of customize it the way you want and you can inherit from form. That's how Windows Forms works. So Windows Forms, you already have baked in a whole bunch of things. So if you look at this kind of from a new light here, this is a class that's just getting rendered. And we dragged on a text box. What we were doing is saying, I want to add a new variable to my class that's of type text box which is a class and we instantiated that class. So we go over here to properties. This kind of makes more sense now. And let's, um, let's drag us out and put it separately. There we go. Um, and we're gonna go back to properties. Notice the lightning bolt and right next to it is the, the wrench and the page thing. That's the properties, but notice all these properties. If you come from an object oriented background, if you know what object oriented is in C sharp, then the word property should kind of flag something in your brain. Because when we look at classes, forget about Windows Forms. When you create a class itself, you create properties and methods by default. Those are the things that you generally create in a class. Now you can also create events. Well, these properties right here 
are our properties. They're properties like in a class. It's just that we have a designer that shows us what those properties are. But these are available as just properties and we can modify the value of that property by changing things. So let's go over to label. That makes a little more sense. So it says the property called text is label one. Well, I can change this to say first name. If I click off it, notice over here it says first name. Cool. So now I can see the, the value of this because I can, I can have it visually match up. What I'm really doing is modifying the value of a property that will then be set for at least the start of our application, kind of the default value for our property because we can have the code change it. And that's another thing is now that we're understanding what properties are, if we come over here, this makes a little bit more sense. Because I said, I want a message box. Let's we'll forget about the, what this isn't for a minute, but I want a message box that said, hello, Tim Corey. So I did a string interpolation. I said, hello. And then I said, text box one, which is a class. And I said, give me the value of text, which is a property on that class. And that's a string property. Notice I hover over it. It's a, has a getter and a setter and it returns a string value. So this is the property that I wanted to access from text box one, but I could make more change. I can work with the properties as well. So I could say text box three, which is the one right below first and last name. I could say dot text, but instead of reading that value, I could say equals and then let's grab this whole thing. We'll take the hello off. So it's just first name, space, last name. So I'm modifying the value of a property of an object or a class instance on my form. So now if I run this, I can say, let's modify the first value, Tim, last name, value, it's Corey, leave the other two alone, hit button. It says, hello, Tim, Corey. And then it now says Tim Corey in label three. So the reason why is I can modify the properties of pretty much anything. I could say, you know what? I don't like the fact that they say um, text box ones, or I'm sorry, the label one or label two says label two and label three says label three. So let's do this. Let's on the constructor, I'm going to say uh, label two dot text equals last name and label three dot text equals full name. And I can run this and notice it says last name and full name. Now, is this the best place to do this? Probably not because probably it's better to see it in the designer and it's probably we don't need to write code for this when we can just have it done as a default. So, but I want to show you that it's possible. It's possible to do this where it says last name and full name, even though it says label two and label three here in the designer, because I've made a change at runtime. I can also change this value as well. So let's just say that every time you click the button, we're going to show the message. We're going to, display, we're going to change the, the full name. Um, and actually, you know what? Let's comment this out. Let's not bother with, with that, um, display. And instead we're just going to say, uh, progress bar one dot, I think it's value. Yep. Value plus equals 10. Okay. So now I hit the button. Notice it goes up and it goes up and so on. Now, I believe I get past here. Yep. <laughs> I can't do that. 105 is not a valid value because there's a minimum and a maximum and I see the maximum, but that shows you that you can make modifications to properties of your objects because these are just objects, which taking a step back, what is form one? It's an object. It's an instance of an object which means that I could also comment this out and I could say 
form one and call it FRM equals new form one. What is this doing? It's creating a new instance of form one. And then I could say for, for FRM dot show, which is a method. Where that method come from? It came from the inheritance from form. So what this does is it shows this particular instance of form one. So if I were to run this, now when I click the button, it actually opens up a second window. Click that button, it opens up a third window. And so if I see in the first window, Tim, Corey, notice it does not modify the second one or the third one because these are different instances of the form. Each one is separate, it's a separate class instance. So form one is a class and we instantiate it when we run, which is how we can create multiple windows very easily. And this is why this is called rapid application development because we can drag and drop stuff on here very quickly and make things work, but we really need to take a step back and understand what's happening here if we want to use this for anything more than just demos or uh, prototypes. Now, I, I do want to say that I have mentioned prototypes more than once, and there is a word of caution here. I personally don't create working prototypes very often. In fact, almost never do I create a working prototype. Instead, I would draw it out on paper. And then I would make my customer, the, the, um, the owner of the project, I'd make them walk through manually by touching the page. There'd be a, you know, there'd be a button on the page, but it's a written page and they'd, you know, push that. And I'd say, okay, flip, 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 flip it. There's where that goes. And this is what happens and kind of give them the narrative, but outside of the digital form. And the reason why is because if you show this to a customer and it's working and it's a pretty cool demo that, you know, kind of does what you think it should do. And they say, yes, can I have this tomorrow? Or can you give this to me today? And you're like, no, this is a prototype. It doesn't actually do everything. It's not really the full application. And they say, no, 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 it's already working. Why would it take you another three months to get this done? Because if it looks too much like it's real, then people think it is real. So be careful on that. But if you're testing something out, want to try something, want to have an initial version, you can, you can do this. You can create something that um, is pretty easy to just kind of bang out in a couple of days or even a couple of hours. But let's talk through, um, you know, what else is going on here? Because it's important to really understand Windows Forms if you're going to work with them. So with Windows Forms, we have this form1.cs that we get right out of the box. Now, I have not done any modifications to this project. I kind of let it be right out of the box. I'm going to show you a new project in a little bit where we kind of do some initial modifications that I recommend in order to make this a better project. But let's look at the other parts of the project first. So how does this work? Like we hit the run button and it just launches that form. How does it know which form to launch? In fact, if we right click on here and say, add um, new form, and let's just call it, because this is the um, don't do it this way demo, I'm gonna leave it as form2.cs. Um, so form2, there we go. And let's just drag on here a, oh, I don't know, a, uh, a label. And we're going to come in here, go to properties and in properties, I'm going to say, uh, form two, and we're gonna make this really big. Let's go to the font and we'll change this font to be 26. Hit okay. Better. And we'll kind of center this. So this is our form two, but oops, I close out properties. That's okay. You can go to uh, view and because I have a, such a large font on my screen, if I scroll down the properties window right down here, F4, there's back. I can unpin that. That's what I wanted to do. But if I have form one and form two, and I launch the demo, this is what launches form one. So 
how would I get to form two? Well, I could put in the button uh, on form one, wait for it. <laughs> it's uh, having problems rendering this form one. Let's close all this. This is the quirky stuff that happens in this application sometimes uh, because it is a new form designer. They had to rewrite the entire thing because of .NET Core. Um, but we don't click on button, go back to this event. We can uh, change this to be form two. So form two, I can just do this equals new. Um, so now it's a form two is going to show. So if I run this, it's sorry, open the first window. I hit button one, there's form two. Okay, that's kind of cool. But what if I wanted form two to the one that started off the bat initially? Well, that's where you have to understand how this application actually gets launched, which is from program.cs. Open that and you'll see that there is this static void main. And inside of here, we'll see we initialize the application configuration and then we say application.run new form one. That's how we're launching our initial form. Now, that's also important because if we run this again, click the button. So now you have form two open. Let's close form one. It closed the entire application, even though form two is open. And that's because what happens here is this initial form that gets run is considered the main form. And so that form will be the lifespan of the application. When that form closes, the application closes. So that's what I think through. There are ways around that, but that's how a Windows form application runs is when the the first form you launch closes, the application closes too. So that's what I think through. But if we change this here to form two instead of form one and run this, this is what we get, form two. That's what launches because that's the starting point of our application. Now, in our application doesn't make a whole lot of sense because form one really was like the main form. The, the form that had all the, the good stuff and the way to open form two and all the rest. But that's where it is. That's how you modify the starting point of your application. It's right here, application.run and which form is it? So that's, that's the basics of our application. Now let's look real quick at, go back to form one, wait for the designer to load. Um, let's look at the toolbox real quick because this is a really big deal. These are, notice the common controls when it opened up and we have button checkbox, check list box, combo box, date time picker, um, notify icon, number up, down, tool tip, text box, and so on. These are the common things that we're used to. These are all common controls here on this page, but we really have a lot more. For example, containers. Um, Container, we can do group box. We can do a tab control. So you have multiple tabs on this form and you click on a different tab. It goes to what looks like a different form, but it's just a different part of the tab form. Um, we can have menus and toolbars. This is kind of cool. We can we can actually bring on, um, one of the ones is the status strip. So you drag and drop this on. Notice down here is a little status strip and it allows us to say, okay, let's put a progress bar here and let's put a, uh, a status label. Now these, these names be horrible. So let's look at, uh, let's pin this here and unpin this. Let's look at, you know, this, this one right here is called tool strip status label one. And this one is called uh tool strip progress bar one. But with this, we could come over to our button and we could comment this out again. Um, we're always commenting this out and unpin this. We can say the tool strip progress bar one uh, dot value plus equals uh, five. And then we could say that the tool strip progress bar or tool strip status label one dot uh, text equals working dot dot dot. So if we run this application now, 
it looks like the the window, notice in Visual Studio, we even have windows like this down here. Um, but it's a little window down here that, or strip that gives us information about what's going on. So you click the button. Now it says working. We got a little progress bar. I can see it load up and we can actually do this on a timer. And we got to the, you know, 100%, it could say ready and then hide this, this progress bar or something like that. So we're very familiar with this. We, we have this down here, this red strip in Visual Studio is something similar. So if we're compiling something that will, you know, show us compiling, if you're downloading something, it would show us downloading. So that's one thing we can do. We can also add uh, a menu strip here. We just drag and drop it um, pretty much anywhere. Notice down here in the, the very bottom, this is where we can modify these items. But we can start saying things like, okay, I want to say file. And I want, under the file menu, I want, I believe the file menu, um, if we do the alt, it's F, and then exit is under the X. So it's been a while since I've done this. Whoops, I double clicked. And again, I created this event. How do I get rid of that event? Great time to talk about this. Well, I can come back, don't delete it here. I can come back to the designer. I can click on the file. I can go to properties, go to events. Notice I had to click event, highlight it and delete it from here. Now come back over here. That code is usually gone, but even if it's not, I can delete it because it's no longer wired up to this file. So go back over to properties and go back to properties themselves. And I believe is it, I think it's the ampersand like so. Yes. Cool. Okay. I haven't lost my touch. So E ampersand X I T enter and notice that it didn't put the ampersand in, but instead what it did, let's zoom in here. It's super tiny. There's an underscore under F There's an underscore under X. And the reason why is because this is for accessibility. So if we were to run this application right now, now that the, these things don't do anything yet, like it doesn't actually exit yet. But if I hit my alt key, notice it highlights the file, but also it's underscore and F. If I hit F, that opens up the file menu. And if I were to hit X, it would run the exit command because this is our alt menu. Now, if I'm in Visual Studio, that's what I just did to make sure that this is the common ones. I hit my alt key and notice how there's underscores under every word. And they're not always the first letter. For example, format the underscores under the O. But if I wanted to open the view menu, I could hit V and then notice the underscores under everything. So for example, the output is underscore under the O and toolbox is underscore under the X and task list is the K and so on. So with that, I can, without using my mouse, go up to the menu and choose something. So if I were to hit Alt F and then hit X, I'm not going to do it, but that would close out Visual Studio. That's a standard uh, thing to do. So it's a standard uh, underscore selection. I'm not sure you can call it, but where we chose to say that F opens the file menu and X is exit. That's what Windows does. So if you're building a Windows form application, you should try to follow the same standards whenever there's standard things. So the file with the exit, Windows, the help or window help um, about, these things are pretty standard in your menu and you could create these things in your menu. So you might say uh, help and then have an about menu. I'm just typing here, by the way but these are now basically buttons. And so in this button, I can actually even have sub things under it, but with about you wouldn't. But when you're creating them, you wanna use the ampersand to indicate the space. I'm sorry, the, the underscore. So if I click on the help, I believe um, help is H and then the about is A. So for help, I come down here in the properties to help and put the ampersand in front of H. And then for about, I put the ampersand in front of A. So now when I hit the alt key and then type H A, I'll get the about menu, which 
let's actually create something for the about menu. So I double click on about, and this creates a click event on this tool strip menu item. Now we're going to talk in the next section about naming because this is really important and this is super ugly. So I know that a lot of you hopefully are freaking out over my naming and that's a good thing. Freak out over it because we should not be naming things this way. We'll get there. We're going to talk about this in a little bit when we talk about the best practices for Windows Forms. But for now, I'm just using the default names. So this is the click event for that menu item. Now we're just going to say message box, which is just that little pop-up box that um, is pretty standard Windows Forms, but um, yeah, it comes kind of baked in. It's the, the simplest way to show data. So we're just going to say... Um, created by Tim. That's our entire about menu. But if we run this now, and I were to say alt H A, it says created by Tim. I can do all this without my key, my mouse, my mouse, sorry. I can do it with just my keyboard, not my mouse, which can be very helpful for accessibility. It's also um, a common way to interact with this this form so that if you have an application that's interacting the form instead of you know a keyboard even you could still enable these menus to be navigated now let's just show you real quick what you do for exit so don't click on the exit there we go i would say i believe it's this dot close this is indicates this particular instance and close what you're gonna do with it. Let's run it, make sure. So Alt F X and it closes out. Now we could do it manually, click on it, exit, works too. But it just gives you more options when you have that ampersand. The, the key is that you can't have two things in the same menu that have the same letter. So if you have more than 26 things in your list, that's a problem. But that's already a problem anyways, because that's pretty intense. Um, Visual Studio is pretty intense and it has uh, six, nine, 12, 14. So the idea of having 26 or more, it's pretty intense. Maybe you have some sub menus there, but because notice the sub menus can have a repeat letter because it's now under that menu is the only context available there. So that is that is the basics here. There's a lot of stuff in here, you know, printing and data and components and so on that you can do, dialog boxes and so on. But let's talk now about, first of all, when would you use WinForms? And then we'll get into the best practices for building a WinForm application. So when would you use WinForms? Well, like I said, rapid application development is really great for prototyping. The idea that you want to create a quick proof of concept that says, hey, does this even work? And you try it out with a quick and dirty form that just gets the job done. That's super helpful sometimes. Now, again, be careful that people don't think that it's the real thing. So you got to be careful who you show that off to. But the other thing is, if you just need a little application to do something, why are you messing around with complexities? So with WPF, UWP, uh, .NET MAUI, they all use what's called XAML, X-A-M-L. And that's a designer language that can be somewhat complex. Now we didn't see any complexity here. We just dragged and dropped things on the form. So it's very quick to create a little application. And if you need just something created that just works, that doesn't take you a lot of time to build, this is a great option. So this can be used in production. In fact, this is probably the most common project type in production today. And you may say, Tim, I don't believe you. Because, you know, the this is desktop only, it's Windows only, the world runs on the web, and I'm sure there's more web projects for C Sharp. I'm not so sure there aren't. And here's why. Because this project type came out with .NET 1, not .NET Core 1, .NET 1, back in 2001, 2002, when .NET first came out. 
And this was visually similar and how it worked is very, very similar to what I used back in Visual Basic 6 and before. So I think Visual Basic 3, I used a drag and drop editor like this. Um, so this has been around, this design of style has been around for years. So when .NET first came out and companies started adopting .NET and becoming, they kind of went to the bleeding edge of new technology and they adopted .NET, they were comfortable with this Windows form drag and drop. And this is what we had for desktop applications. We didn't have WPF yet. So when they, they decided to build their applications, they built it in Windows forms. But then they still have those applications around today, a lot of those companies, and they just kept building on them. So those applications are still around, they're still existing and they're still running. And so when it comes to, you know, manufacturing environments and uh, office, you know, businesses that work in offices and, and so on, businesses that create their own applications, there are a lot of Windows form applications out there. Microsoft has repeatedly tried to make new desktop application types and has fallen down over and over again, trying to get them to become adopted as the primary desktop type. First, it was WPF, and that was much more complicated compared to Windows Forms because it didn't just drag and drop. Now you can, but that wasn't the, the strength of it or how it really uh, flourished and benefited. So it was more complex, which meant it wasn't a rapid application development tool anymore. It was just a development tool now. So people still kind of fell back to, well, this is easier. And it's like stuck with Windows Forms. And then they came out with UWP and Microsoft said, this is the future. And it's tied into only the latest edition of Windows. And like people said, yeah, but I'm still supporting older versions of Windows. So I'm not going to do that. And in fact, now UWP has been deprecated it's actually died off and Windows form is still around and kicking and still a pretty popular uh, form type or desktop type. And then, you know, the .NET Maui now, people are saying, well, this is gonna replace everything. Yes, but maybe, I'm not convinced of that yet, but even if it did, even if .NET Maui is everything everyone wants and is the best desktop and mobile application type there is, even if all that's true, it's starting from today. Windows Forms has a 20 year head start. And you may say, well, Tim, the web's been around forever and the web is the way to go. Well, again, no, because the web has not been the way to go when it comes to building business applications for very long. And by very long, I mean, maybe the past 10 years has all it's been but Windows Forms has been around for over twice that. And again, before that, it was something similar that people were familiar with. So when they switched over to .NET, they used what they were familiar with. So therefore, there's a lot of companies out there still using Windows Forms. Now, if you were to build a new application today, would I recommend Windows Forms? Probably not. I would probably recommend WPF. If you want a desktop application, maybe if you really felt you needed to, I, maybe I'd recommend .NET MAUI, but it's still pretty early in the, in the game for that. The UPF is tried and true. Now you may twitch at that, but there's a lot of good reasons for that. We can get into that in a different video, but with Windows Forms, I probably wouldn't recommend it for a new application for a lot of reasons, but there are a few that I would recommend it in. First of all, it is a great rapid application development tool. So if you need something quick, Windows Forms is the way to go. Also, it's simple. So if you're a one person shop and you have to develop a big application, well, the simpler it is, the easier it is to maintain. Therefore, yeah, Windows Forms is a great option. So there are a few cases when Windows Forms makes sense for new applications, but even if it doesn't make sense for most new applications, it still has a place and it is one of the most common project types you'll see when you work in business. So when you work in a company, you're gonna see us, you're 
likely to see this in a .NET shop. You're likely to see Windows Forms at some point. Even if they're trying to switch over to web, even if they're trying to switch over to a later version, you'll probably see some applications still running in Windows Forms because it's just so easy. And in fact, if you're creating a little tool to help you out, guess what you're gonna use probably? Windows Forms. This is the tool to use when you wanna create a little tool for yourself, a little utility that just works and it's pretty quick. So that's when to use it. Uh, let's talk best practices and and how to use it well. Now, first of all, I wanna point off, point out that when I resize this, notice how it kind of cuts things off. These things don't move around. This is why I say that WPF is probably the right choice for new applications because by default, now you can you can definitely make this you know, work the way you want with a lot of work because it's just code. But by default, your form is whatever size you develop it in. And if you maximize it, you just get a whole bunch of extra space. And if you resize it too small, you cut off what's on the form. There's no scroll bars here. It's just, you can create scroll bars that, you know, can do the job, but it's ugly. Um, so, Windows Forms is kind of like what you see is what you get. So that's something to think through. Now let's close this out. I'm going to go back to my Solution Explorer and we're gonna create a new project. So we're gonna create a new project for Windows Form app. And we're gonna call this uh, Better WinForms Demo. And yes, .NET 6 still. So this is the, the best practices for how to deal with Windows Forms. So let's talk about when you first start your project up, what do you do? Well, I'm gonna start by saying a startup project. So if we first start this up, what are the things that I do every time? Well, first of all, I come down here to, win, or to Form 1 and I rename this. So I click on it, I click on it again, or you can right click on it and say rename or hit F2. I'm gonna say main form. And it's going to say, hey, you're renaming a file. Would you also like to perform a rename of this project of all references to the code element form one? Well, yes, I definitely would. And so now if we right click and say view code, notice it says partial class form or main form, not form one. And if you go to program.cs, it says main form, not form one. So that's the first tweak I do. Now, whoops, let's open back up. I do want to point out one thing. The eagle eye among you will see that it still says up here, form one. Why is that? Because this is not a, the class name. It is actually just a, the default value for a property. If we go to properties and pin that, and we go to, notice it says text down here for properties. It says form one. So I can say, main form like so, once you click out of it, it renames. I can say main form um, by Tim Corey, something like that if you wanna do a, a more descriptive thing, but that, that describes what your form is. So that's the next thing I do is I rename uh, or change the text of my form to be something more uh, logical. Next up, before I do anything else, I come up here to font. Now, because I'm on a demo with you, and let's unpin this, I'm gonna make my font into about 18. But for you, you might wanna go with a 14 or a 16, but even 18 is probably pretty good. Hit okay. Now, this makes the form massive. And this is one of those quirks in the editor that I'm not a huge fan of is it says, oh, since your form is bigger, that probably means that everything else should relatively be bigger as well. So since I went from nine to 18, it basically doubled the size of everything, width and height. We don't want that. So use your um, scroll bars here to go to the lower right-hand corner, put your cursor on the um, that little box in the corner, click and drag, and resize it back to a normal size. Now you could also go to the, the form and go to, I think it's width, um, oh, size right here. 
yeah, there you go. Under size, there's width and height. You could change this to, uh, you know, 500 and then 400. Like so, it knows how it resizes it for you there. So you could just do that in the properties. Again, these properties represent the values that are then displayed in the designer. So if I just change this, notice that my width and height change. So that's the next thing I do though, is I resize it after change in the font, which the value of doing so is when I come to common controls here and I say label and I drag a label on like so, notice that label is much larger. The, the text in it is larger because by default, the font size is 18 instead of nine because the, the default for your, your text boxes, your buttons, your labels, all the fonts of anything you drag on this form now, the default value will be the current value of the form's font size and also font choice. So if you chose Arial instead, then it'd be Arial 18 point. But I want to point this out. If I were to go back to form one in our original demo and I were to change this form, let's go up to our form here and change the font size to be 18, hit okay. Um, it made a mess out of, it, out of everything, but notice that, oh, it did change. Nice. Um, let's undo this for a minute. So let's just say that I changed, and this is what I forgot. Okay. It's been a bit, but it did change all my font size. It also stretched everything out, which is horrible. Um, but let's just say I change first name to be 10 point. Okay. 10 point. There we go. It's a little bigger. Now let's go back to my form and change this to be 18. First name is still tiny. Why is that? Because this no longer uses the defaults. It uses its own value. It's overriding the default. And the default is where the form is. But now that I've changed it, it says, well, if you changed it, that means that's what you want. Therefore, uh, I'm going to leave it at that size. But it messed everything else and it caused all kinds of problems. So really, if you already have a, let's change this back as well. If you already have a form that's already started, you really don't want to make some changes to your defaults anymore. It kind of causes problems. So uh, let's hit save. If you're on your new form, change the defaults first and then don't mess them. So now I can drag and drop this label on. Well, let's get a first name. I'm going to change it label here to say first name. But I'm also going to scroll to the very top of the properties where it says label one. I'm going to change this to be first name label. Now, there's some important things to note here. This is where some old school wind form people are going to disagree with me and that's okay, but I think I'm right. So let's talk about it. Um, first off, I have used camel case for my label name. Why? Well, because if you think through what's actually happening here, this name isn't a property. It is the variable name for this element. So if you're going to create a new instance of a class and give it a variable name, you would give it camel casing because it's a variable, a private variable. Well, that's what this is. It's a variable called first name label. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to name it as if it is a variable because it is. Second off, I did not say LBL first name for label first name, which is a, had been a pretty common syntax for naming our variables back in the day. Remember that this came from the first version of Visual Studio or of, of .NET. So .NET 1 had Windows Forms and then it was really modeled after what we had in Visual Basic 6 and others with the drag and drop designer, where I remember Microsoft even recommending what's called Hungarian casing. So that's where you give the type in the name. So you start off a text box with TXT and a labeled LBL, and the thought is it makes it easier to read. 
But here's the problem. Microsoft actually did a 180 on this. They used to recommend Hungarian notation, and now they strongly recommend against Hungarian notation. So if you're an old school Microsoft person and you kind of grew up in this, you say, hey, you know, Microsoft even recommends doing LBL or TXT. No, they don't. But yes, they used to. You're not remembering incorrectly. They used to. It's just that they changed with the times. And the reason why is because it does not read properly. So when, remember, code is meant to be read by humans, not by compilers, by humans. Otherwise, we'd call this label A, the next one B, because it's more efficient that way. But that's not what we're doing. We're calling it first name label because it's meant to be read by humans. When you read down through code, it is easier and less jarring to read first name label because that's how you'd say it. Oh, that's the first name label. So if I said, what is this? You wouldn't say that's the LBL first name. That doesn't make sense. But you'd say that's the first name label. Well, that's what this is. We have to the spaces out. So it describes what it is in a way that is easy to read in English. So that's how we name things. So that's first name label. So next best practice is always name your objects and do it first. Okay, so let's put a text box on here. Uh, text box, we'll drag it on. You can align it. Notice the different alignment points. So top, there's that line for the top. Bottom, there's a line for the bottom. But there's one more for text boxes that's pretty important. If you drag down that a little more, notice that there is a line goes through the text box and it's right underneath the first name. And what this is, is it aligns the text. So the text in the text box will be in alignment with the text first name. So that's usually what I do for text boxes and labels. What's the first thing you should do when you create any property, or drag any property out of the, or object onto the, the form? Come up here, rename it. First name text. Okay. I can, if you click on a form once and drag, you can drag a selector, select multiple things, and you can move them around as one. Super helpful. Now let's put a button on here. We're gonna make this a little bigger. We're gonna kind of position where you think we should. Um, and I'm gonna remember, first thing you do, rename it. So I'm gonna call this the um, first, or um, say hello button. Okay, and then down here, I'm gonna say, say hello on the text. There we go. Now, by the way, this resizing, that changes the height and the width, and the size right over here. It changes that based upon what I do. So you can modify that however you want. And then I can, you know, readjust re the form to fit and so on. But why is it so important that I name things first instead of later? Maybe I can come back and do it later. Well, the problem is if I double click on say hello, notice what it did. It created a method for me, the event handler. Cool. We know that. But notice it says say hello button on a square click as opposed to what it was in, let's go back over here to our form one, where it says button one. And if we go to the button one event, it says button one. So now here's a kicker. If I come back over here and say, oh, I forgot to rename this. We got properties here. Let's come up here to button one. We gotta say, um, uh, let's call it uh, greet user button. And we'll come down here and change it from button one to create user. Cool. I fixed that problem. Awesome. Let's double click on it again. And it's button one. Didn't change that. Didn't change the name because this name has already been created at this point. So it's not going to change it, which means that if you come over here to form one's code 
and say, okay, where was that event for the greeting button? And you can't find it. And you have a whole bunch of button one, button two, button three, button four events. And you're like, which one is it? I, oh, I come over here and find the event, which only works for the primary event, not for the other events that are not the primary event. Because for those, you have to come up here, select it, then go to properties, then go to events, then find it and go, oh, it's named button one underscore click. Mm, okay. And then you can actually double click there and go to it. But that's why we name things first. Because then you go, oh, say hello button. Cool. That's there. Okay. Now you can rename that and there's ways to do that. But I want to point out that's the, the basics of why we name things first. Also, if you're not sure if you've named everything, go to properties. Notice that up here it says say hello button. That's what's selected. If you click on this, this is a drop down. Click it, it shows you all the things in my form. Now there's not many, but this shows you anything that's named label one, form one, button one, text box one, all those kind of things. In fact, if we go over to our form one and do the same thing. We can see there's a lot more here. We can see checkbox one. Um, we have form one. We have label one, label two, menu strip one, progress bar one, status strip one, text boxes one through four, tool strip, progress bar one, and labels. So it's all these ones at the end. You go, oh, that's a problem. Let's fix all of those. Now you kind of made a mess already because of all your events, but at least you're making progress and you can change those things for your events as well. Just takes a little more work. So that's another best practice when it comes to creating your form is to label things or name things right away. And it's also important because notice if I select these two things, I can control C to copy and control, well, I'll wait for it to be done spinning. Um, every once in a while you catch the designer, designer off guard, uh, hit control V and it lines up and you go, oh, this is actually last name. Okay. Yeah, it's more than that. It's called label one. So label one and text box one. Whoops. Need to fix that. So I'll come over here to the top and say, this is last name label. And then you can come over here and notice the, it's kind of gray here, but it's already selected the same property. If they both have the same property, they both do, they both have a name property. So I can just start typing. So last name text without clicking. That's a little bit of a speed booster thing. So now I have things labeled properly. Also try and name things the same. So first name label, last name label. And so those are, you know, the same pattern, but also first name label, first name text, those two go together. Last name label, last name text, those two go together. So it's something to think through. Now let's run this real quick. We haven't wired up the button, but that's okay. Um, and let's bring it over here. And I let's say, Tim, I hit tab and it goes to say hello. I hit tab again, then it goes to last name. Well, that's that's not right. My tab order is incorrect. And that's because I created the first name, the, the first name text box, and then the button next. Well, so the next thing to do is to check your tab order. So let's wait for Visual Studio to catch up. We're gonna go to down here where it says tab index of one and tab stop of true. So what this is, again, for accessibility. If you don't use a mouse, can't use a mouse, um, for whatever reason, you can tab through the form in order using just your tab key, but only if it's in the right order. And only if the things that aren't selectable aren't selectable, and only if, if the things that are selectable are selectable. Um, yeah, hope it makes sense. So tab index of one, that's the first thing to list. Notice the button says tab index of two, and this one says tab index of four. Okay, so how do you fix this? Well, so let's, this one right here, it's one, cool. This one should be the next one in order, so let's make this two. And this one should be three, okay? And they all say tab stop, yes. Notice the labels say, um, doesn't have a tab stop on them because they, can't be tabbed to, I don't believe. Um, so 
tab stop of one, tab stop of two, tab stop of, or tab index of three. So there we go, uh, tab index here. I'm not, I'm not sure why you even have this um, because you can't tab to a label, but let's try it. What you can, you can have, the numbers don't necessarily matter. You could say one, 10, 50, if you wanted to. And that might even make sense because you might say, hey, you know what? We're gonna possibly put things in the middle. And so we're gonna say one, 10, 50. And then if we have something that goes in the middle, we can have a 45. Um, what happens behind the scenes is Visual Studio says, what's the next one that is both tabbable and is next in line? Doesn't matter what the number is. So now, you know, we have our label starts at zero. We can't tab to it. So we've got a cursor in first name. We hit tab. Now our cursor's in last name. Hit tab again. Now our cursor's highlighting this button. Notice it's kind of the blue outline here. If I were to hit the space bar, I can actually click the button. Let's just kind of verify that. Um, let's we'll click on say hello. Well, let's wait for the designer to figure things out. Let's come over here to our event. And we're going to say, again, that message box dot show. And we're going to say uh, string interpolation. We'll say hello, uh, first name text dot text and space last name text dot text. See how the naming actually helps you out. Because even if you didn't quite remember, you'd say, well, I think it's, it's the first name something. Well, first name text. Um, the other thing that's going to mess you up, let's just run this first and I'll talk about that because it's important. Okay. So Tim, tab, Corey, tab, space. Hello, Tim, Corey. I hit space again, close it down. Now if I hit tab again, it goes back to the beginning at Tim because that's, we, we got to the end of our tab stops. So we start over at the beginning. Now, the first thing that's going to trip you up at some point or not the first thing, but one of the things going to trip you up at some point is you're going to do this. First name text, last name text. Cool. You run this and it even seems to work. So you're going to say, Tim, Corey, say hello. Hello, system.windows.form.text box. Text Tim, system.windows.form.text box. Text Corey. And you're like, that's not what I was expecting. Well, the reason why is because you use the entire object. Again, object-oriented programming. You use the entire class. And this class does have a default to string method that actually prints out more than just the, the name of the class. It prints out all the properties that are non-standard, I believe. Uh, it might just be the text. I'm not positive. Um, because what you should be doing is specifying which property you want. I want the text property. Okay, there you go. Now that will work properly. So there's another little pitfall for you to avoid. Now, when it comes to multiple forms, we're gonna wrap this up pretty soon, but when it comes to multiple forms, so I want you to think through is the fact that when you instantiate a new form, it's just a class with a constructor, which means if you wanna pass values to another form, let's just do that real quick. Um, if you wanna pass values to another form, Let's do this down here. We already have form one and form two. So let's say we want to change, have a, I'm going to copy and paste this and I'm not going to change the name. I know it's, it's, it hurts me, but um, this is label two. So where it says form two, we're going to wipe this out and there's not a value here yet. But when I open up my class for this, so view code, I'm going to change form two to say string um, message. And I have a private string uh, form message like so. And then I'll in here say form, I actually, there you go, form message equals message. It's helping me out. And then I could actually even right in here say, uh, label two dot text equals for message. So I'm saying to the constructor, you don't just have an empty constructor. You want to take in a value. 
which means that if I were to come over here to form one's code and just try to, let's comment these out and let's uncomment these. If I were to try to do this, it goes, <laughs> no, 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 no. You need to pass in a value of message to the constructor. So we can say, hello from form one, like so. Now let's set us back a startup project and run this. And if I were to say greet user, it opens a new form. It says, hello from form one. It passed data from one form to the other. So you can pass data in and you can even pass in the instance of this particular form in the constructor so they can call things back the other direction. There's lots of cool stuff you can do with Windows Form. I actually go into a lot more depth in the Tournament Tracker application. It is a .NET framework project that we do, but um, all the same things apply. And I do have a course actually that upgrades the Tournament Tracker application to .NET Core 3.0, I believe. Um, so it's possible to upgrade a .NET Core. But I just wanna show off that you can pass data back and forth because it's just a class. And this is where, again, I really don't like it when courses say Windows Form drag and drop is the place to start as a developer because it's magic. But when you understand object-oriented programming, when you understand inheritance and interfaces and constructors and properties and methods and events, then you go, oh, this is just a class. And I can use this class to do pretty much whatever I want because it's like any other class. I instantiate it, I can create multiple instances, I can have multiple constructors, I can pass instances into other classes and pass them back and all the rest of the cool stuff you can do with object-oriented programming, you can do in WinForms. It's just, you'll have a visual output for it instead of just uh, it being logic or data access or something else. So that's the next thing that um, you can do with WinForms that's important to know about. Let's get back to our best practices though. Another best practice, and this is, again, I am old school. I have seen this done. I have done this many times. Please learn from my mistakes. Don't do this. Okay, right click on your main form, go to view code. It's awful tempting, awful tempting to put all of your code here. In fact, people say, well, how else can I data bind directly to my SQL server than if I, if I don't put my code right in the code behind for main form? Guess what? You shouldn't be data binding directly to your SQL server. Sorry, just don't do that. Because yeah, it works until it doesn't. It works until you have two, three, four thousand lines of code in the code behind. Yes, I have seen that. Yes, I have participated in that. That's almost entirely a bad idea. Because when it comes time to change over, maybe you say, you know what? This idea of the form, it just doesn't reside. Like it, it is what it is and it's, it's messy and we don't, we want to have more responsiveness. We want to use a graphics card. This is not use a graphics card when it comes to rendering things. We want to have some more interactivity, all that good stuff. We want to be able to do all of that. We can't do it as easily in WinForm. We want to change over to WPF. Well, guess what? You have to rewrite your entire application because all of your code lives here. Don't do that. Instead, create a class library. Put all of your code in the class library, except for the code that specifically interacts with the user interface. That code is user interface code and it stays in the WinForm project. But for example, even this right here would probably end up being in the class library. We just call a method that says, here's the data, give me the, the data to display. Okay, put as much as possible in your class library. That way, when it comes time to replace your user interface, you can do so much more easily. When it comes time to upgrade your user interface, you can do so much easier. When it goes from .NET 6 to .NET 7, when, if you are using a, you know, for example, 
maybe went all in on UWP. And then Microsoft says, and we're deprecating it. We still support it, but we're not doing anything new for it. And you go, oh, but I want new stuff. I want to move to Maui. Well, if you had put all of your code in the code behind, you got a problem. You got work to do. But if you had put all of your code that you can into a class library, it's much easier to swap those out. So if at all possible, put 90 plus percent of your code in your class library and just reference it. That's my next best practice. So for example, data access should not be in your user interface. Just shouldn't be there. Put it in your class library. All right, so that's my next best practice for WinForms. Um, WinForms can be a great project type. Oh, let's, let's do one more tweak. It's not a best practice, but it's a tweak. Put my semicolon here and make this a file scope namespace. Yes, you can do that in Windows Forms. Makes things easier. Makes it four less spaces horizontally. So, all right, with that, um, that's kind of the best practices for Windows Forms. There's a lot more depth to go into, but as you can see, this has already been a pretty epic video. Um, I wanted to just get into the topic of how to get started in WinForms, how to use them and when to use them. And again, when to use them once you know C Sharp pretty well. Don't start here. Don't make this your starter project until you know C Sharp really well. That's why I teach um, beginner C Sharp out of the console application because console application isn't using, or is not, um, we're not making use of the inheritance structure nearly as much. And there's not a lot of magic there. It's just pretty simple stuff because we want to focus on learning C sharp. And people often say, you know, should I, if I'm learning, I want to learn C sharp. So should I do WinForce? Well, no. And they may say, well, okay, should I learn ASP.NET Core instead? And it can <laughs> stop, pause. Those are user interfaces. WinForms, WPF, uh, UWP, .NET MAUI, Blazor, uh, MVC, API, Razor Pages. These are all user interfaces. Even console to user interface. What you want to focus on is learning C Sharp, the code. You might say, well, Tim, I want to be a WinForm developer. Well, yes, as you've seen, all WinForms is, is classes instantiation, properties, events, and so on. So when you learn C Sharp, you are learning almost everything you need to know about Windows Forms. And Windows Forms, the stuff you need to know is just a little bit added on top that you inherit from. Like that's that's really the, the big deal once you know C Sharp. But if you don't know C Sharp, then this is just magic and it just works with you drag and drop. And when the magic breaks, bad things happen. So I would encourage you learn C sharp first, then choose which user interface you best want to learn and start with that. But don't get caught up in saying, I'm only going to do .NET MAUI, or I'm only going to do MVC. Learn the different user interface types because knowing multiple is going to be very helpful because even if you are a web developer, there are times when you could use a little utility and almost always little utilities need to be desktop applications. Web applications and utilities just don't work that well. They don't do what they're designed to do and they're more complicated. They need a web server to host them and all this stuff just create a little WinForm app. I have multiple little utilities on my machine that I do for various projects to make, to automate some of the things that take time. Otherwise it makes my life easier. And I do that through console apps. I do that through WinForm apps. Um, every once in a while, WPF app, but almost always it's either a console or a WinForm app. So I would encourage you get to know the various product types, but learn C sharp first. I hope this answers a lot of your questions around getting started in WinForms though. If you have other questions, leave them down below. I also have a suggestion site. So suggestions.imtimcorey.com. If you want to see a future topic covered, like if, you know, if you want to say, Hey, I want more depth on WinForms or, you know, where I go for this, then go to, uh, suggestions.imtimcorey.com and leave that suggestion there. I'll also kind of prompt you to go there. If you leave that type of suggestion on the, on the YouTube comments, because 
I don't have a way of keeping track of YouTube comments. There's just thousands that come in every week and I barely even see them all. So trying to keep track of, of who suggested something three months ago is difficult. So that's why we have a suggestion site where you can go and leave a suggestion, vote on a suggestion, and hopefully see your suggestion answered in a future uh, video here on YouTube. So with that, like I said, if you have any questions, leave them down below. I'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, if you want to go further, or you want to know what the other product types are or how things fit, go to csharpprojects.com. I have a site there that gives you an overview of all the different project types from Visual Studio, how to get started in them, how to go deeper in them, where they fit in the overall ecosystem of .NET and so on. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.